Welcome to A Thousand Tiny Steps. I'm Barb Higgins, and in this podcast, I'll share personal stories of great joy and tragedy and the steps that brought me there. I have become adept at tracing them backward to find the origin of an event, good or bad, that has affected my life. I have gone from being on top of the world with Division I All-American success to being unable to get out of bed with the grief of losing a child and everything in between. I am painfully honest, which can make people uncomfortable, but discomfort brings growth and oftentimes tragedy brings joy. So tie, buckle, slip on, release up your shoes and join me as we begin our thousand tiny steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here, beginning episode 43, and this will be episode two of season five of A Thousand Tiny Steps. So this season, for those of you listening to this one for the first time, talks about when I returned to New Hampshire from Massachusetts in, in 1989. It starts there and it will go through 1989, really till probably about until meeting Kenny. 1989 to meeting Kenny would be seven years. I met Kenny in 1996. I had a lot happen to me during that time. So before I get started, I just did a Facebook Live. This is, today is June 17th. I'm in these two different groups, a group called The Nest and a group called Power Play. And so, or Power Circle. The two people leading these groups are both online entrepreneurs who do very, very well working with primarily women, although KK works with men and women, but the majority of her audience is women. And so I'm in these two groups that are not related to each other at all. And for the past like two group meetings, the messages are identical. I'm hearing the same thing from two very different people. It makes me realize that there are certain things I should be focusing on. This brings me to where I'm picking up for this episode. So last episode, I talked about making the decision to move up here and what it was like to drive up and starting my new job late and all of that. This episode will focus on, if I had to think of a name for this episode, it might be, you can't go home again, or can you? When I moved to Concord, I was very, very sure that I was just coming home for a year, that I was going to get out of debt and reassess my life and then pick the next place to live. And that was in 1989 and it's now 2022. And as I look out the window, I'm looking at the top of the park that I grew up on. My entrance was at the bottom, but I have not left. So all those years ago, right? 33 years, I've been back here in Concord. And that's, that's longer than I had been alive when I moved home. Maybe you can go home again. It doesn't mean you should or shouldn't, but this is what I chose to do. And sometimes when I'm feeling bad about myself, I think that oftentimes the places I would choose to live would be just Concord, New Hampshire, somewhere else. I spent a long time in Amesbury. Now, Amesbury has a lot more culture. It's located near the seacoast. It's town after town. Towns are all close together in Massachusetts. So it's just different, but it's somebody else's, you know, somebody's growing up in Amesbury. You can't wait to get out of there and wants to go live somewhere else. So I try to remind myself of that sometimes. That really, when we vacation or go see things, we're just going to someone else's hometown where they've lived their whole life and wish they could get out of. And that's how I placate myself at times. So I really, truly did feel that I would not be returning, you know, staying in Concord, that it would be very temporary. It's why I didn't try to get an apartment that first year. You know, I was paying off debt. Starting to date Chaz, you know, cutting ties to Boston and starting to date Chaz and getting involved in AA created community for me. And I started to do community things. I talked about the Victorian Society and I was in two plays. I was in Trial by Jury. And then a year later, I was in Pirates of Penzance. My slow but, but sort of sure connection to my community and reconnection to places and things I had you know, been connected to as a child began to sort of suck me in, so to speak. So I taught the one year at Second Start and it didn't work out. And I've, I've mentioned before, that was my second job and the second job I lost or wasn't asked to come back to or mutually agreed I should move on. And during that summer, the summer of 1990, I was you know, very seriously involved with Chaz. He was away all summer working in Yellowstone National Park. He was an outdoorsy AMC, Appalachian Mountain Club kind of guy. And this was with, I don't even remember who he was working with now, but they take care of national parks out West. So he was stationed at Yellowstone and he was there for the whole summer. And so there was no Zoom calls, there were no cell phones. The only way you could really talk to one another was on a landline. And you know, when you're out in the middle of the woods, there are no landlines or writing letters, snail mail. I flew out to visit him. And I remember I actually flew out to California twice that summer. Once was to go to Yellowstone and once was Fresno. I was working at a track meet in Fresno. And so I got to go to Yosemite National Park and then I saw Yellowstone. 
Western National Parks that begin with Y. That was the summer of 1990. The biggest change for me, and what I'll talk about in this episode, because it comes back in my life again and again and again in a number of ways, is addiction. And I think it's one of the reasons I didn't rush to head back to Boston for sure. I remember my, my track coach for Nike, Bob 70, used to call Boston a cesspool. Ah, it's a cesspool. He had a really raspy voice. And in some ways it was, but any place is. When people gossip and talk and spread lies and rumors and that sort, that sort of thing, things can get pretty ugly. And when you're in the athletic world, you're in a very ego-driven world, and there are quite a few narcissists, something else I have come to sadly know and well, very well in my life. As I began to really embrace sobriety, I really also began to embrace Concord because it was completely different than anything I was doing when I was living in Boston. And when I get into talking about my college years, this, this will make more sense. But I came home on Labor Day weekend and September 23rd went to my first AA meeting. So those of you that don't know what AA stands for, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's a very, very, very old group. And I have my big book here, Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was started by two men who realized that nothing medical was fixing their alcoholism, Bill and Bob. The other thing about AA is it's anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. So when you stand up to speak, you give your first name, but you don't give your last name. And when you run into one another, I can remember, you know, when I was first in AA and I'd run into somebody from a meeting and whoever I was with might say, how do you know them? And I'd say, oh, friend of Bill's. And they don't know what that means necessarily, but if you're a friend of Bill's, it means you go to meetings. Or if people would come up and I would say, how do I know you? Well, I'm a friend of Bill's. Oh, right. And so I dove into AA. When I say that, I, I went once a week, but I did the reading. I would go to, sometimes I'd go to smaller meetings or go to meetings with other people, but that Monday nights was my, my meeting. And I had set up for myself, like I always do, a very busy schedule with plays running and weight training and, and all of that. And plus I was teaching and I was living at the time, I lived for 18 months with my parents out in Webster. So it was a 20, 22 minute drive for anything. You know, if I needed something, my whole life existed in Concord, except all my stuff in my body slept overnight at, in Webster. My days were packed and AA became a staple in my life. And I met some amazing people. I met a guy named Jim, who I dated for a long time on again, off again, who was active in the program with me. I reconnected with a friend of mine, Terry, and who passed away not long after I met him. I ran into Harriet. She was the mother of my best friend growing up, and she was so happy to see me in this meeting. It was one of my biggest, biggest hugs in AA. I ran into a neighbor of mine, Dick, so I knew him as a father figure growing up, you know, a parent of my neighbors. He was super happy to see me. I ran into a woman named Sheila, whose older sister was Maura, who was my good friend that died, that troubled, you know, messed up my childhood in some ways so much. So I started to create a new group for myself, a new friend group, a new acquaintance group, a new let's meet for copy group. You know, and I spent a lot of time working and then I had my running group. So I joined Granite State Racing Team. Bob Teshik had just started it and we, we worked out on Tuesday evenings. So, you know, Tuesday evenings was my, my running workout if it wasn't winter. And so I started to get involved in the racing community again and training. And I believe that I actually had Seb coach me again, but I never rejoined. I ran for Nike Boston, but I never moved back to the Boston area. I had all the nice fancy gear and I ran the track meets. For a fall of 89 to fall of 90, I lived with my parents and I maintained living there. Over that summer, I applied for several jobs and I actually was given a job in Concord. And the person that interviewed me and offered me the job was Chris Rath. She was actually one of the interviewers. And I applied for a job at Runlet, which was a junior high then. And she saw, no, 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 but I have the perfect job for you. And she actually suggested that I interview for the job at Walker School. When I was doing my student teaching for special ed, she was my student teaching advisor. She was getting her doctorate at Boston University at the time. And she was my student teaching advisor. It's interesting, you know, I met her my senior year of college. I met Chris Rath, not knowing that one day she would decimate my life and just be so horrible, hook up with some other horrible people. It's funny. It's like I, when I met Chaz, I didn't know he'd unplug Molly. So it's amazing. Sometimes the people you meet come back around in ways you don't expect. I started teaching in Concord. And the other thing that I did was started coaching cross country. So of course, running was everything to me and running and my ability to be a good runner got me a free education. It got me a shoe contract. I traveled all over the United States and Canada as a runner. So unbelievably lucky. To this day, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky. I did not take good advantage of it. And part of that would be my addiction issues. As I entered year two of living here, was now teaching in the district that I grew up in and coaching the team that I once ran for. So that first year, not only did I coach cross country, then I was offered the indoor track job and then I did one season of spring track or maybe two. So suddenly I'm coaching three seasons 
and I'm teaching. Now my job was four days a week, 80%. So what I did is I went five days a week and I just left school early so that I had time in between teaching and coaching. And at the time I was still living, you know, out with my parents. So I didn't want to drive all the way home to drive all the way back. But partway through that year, I moved from Webster into Concord. And I moved in with a woman named Cheryl Barassa, who was teaching at the high school at the time. And Cheryl and I lived together also not very long, about a year and a half, maybe even a little under that, maybe just about a year. So I moved in with Cheryl and we lived, you know, in downtown Concord. And so suddenly I had all this free time because I wasn't spending all this time in the car. And I stopped having to carry 9,000 bags with me because my house was equidistant between Walker School, the YMCA, and Concord High School. I was just, you know, within ride your bike distance to all of those places. And that was, that was wonderful. And that brought another realm into my life, another social realm, because I started now to, you know, Cheryl had people over and I met her boyfriend, who's now her husband. And it was just a wonderful life. So all during this time, as I'm setting up new realities for myself, I am sober. I am not drinking. I did not have one drop of alcohol from 1989, September of 89, until I would have to say it was 1996 sometime. I don't know exactly when. I'd have to, I'd have to really think about it. And then it was just, you know, sort of some casual drinking and then it escalated as it always will. AA was, was profound for me. It was easy for me to make the just quit drinking choice because I was not a daily drinker and I had never been a daily drinker. And I had given up alcohol for months at a time, several times in my life. When I was in high school and, you know, half the senior class could drink when they were 18, I didn't drink during sports seasons because that's how you get kicked off a team back then. When I ran for BU and for Nike, there were huge chunks of time I didn't work. When the championship part of the season came, none of us drank. We all quit drinking. There were chunks of time I did not drink. Even if I was in a drinking phase, I didn't drink every night. It didn't dawn on me that a weeknight would be for drinking. I'll talk about that later in later episodes when I get into when I met Kenny. It was easy for me to rack up sobriety. The first time I really noticed that I wasn't drinking is when I went to the USA Track and Field Convention. And it was in Washington, D.C. that winter. And I visited my friend Maricel and I told her all about it. She had little babies and, you know, I was still trying to pull myself together. I went to college with Maricel, but so much of my fun at these track and field conventions had been around the drinking. Everybody drinks. You go to the meetings, you go out and drink. I remember sitting in a, at a bar and I was fine. And somebody said, here, Barb, here's a beer. And my friend, Peter Farrell just dove across. No, she doesn't drink. And I'm like, Farrell, I'm not going to drink a beer because I smell it. You know, it really wasn't difficult for me. And I really, really enjoyed diving into the AA. And so I began a long period of time where I was, where I was sober. That second year, teaching at Walker School and living with Cheryl, I also had a long, long, strong friendship with a former student of mine named Megan. Megan and I were such good friends right up until, I mean, we're still good friends, but I haven't seen her or spoken to her in years. And it's one of those things you come in and out of each other's lives. But once I had babies, you know, got married and had babies, it was hard for us to coordinate time together. But during those early years of me coming back to Concord, I spent hours with Megan, hours. And even though she was nine years younger than me, that's nothing now. <laughs> Some of my best friends now are 20 years younger than me or even more. I was unbelievably busy. And that following summer, the summer of, well, the summer of 1990 and the summer of 1991, both of those summers, I spent huge amounts of time with Megan. None of those things involved drinking alcohol. You know, it just didn't. I wasn't a drinker. She was too young to drink. It didn't really ever come up. And I had no trouble at social events not drinking. After a while, now it was on my mind in the beginning, like any new habit will be. For a while, all you're thinking about is the habit you've given up. You know, it's why I don't like to diet. The minute I, I'm on an official diet, I just cheat. The only thing I can do well on is like paleo challenges and like a CrossFit challenge. If I sign up for a challenge, I can usually do it because I paid the money. So you have that investment. But I have a very, very sharp memory. And I got up in the morning and I would go to Washington Street Cafe when it was first opened and get a coffee. But I think it was called Washington Street Cafe by then. It was called In a Pinch. And then In a Pinch moved. And then when it was bought by someone else, it was the Washington Street Cafe. At any rate, I got a puppy, <laughs> which was a mistake. I got a puppy in 1991. But one of my big memories of this time, I would go get a coffee and I would go to White's Park and I'd bring the puppy and I'd walk the puppy and the puppy could run around, Sam or the bammer, pooch, 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 puppy tug. I would drink my coffee. And so this particular morning I woke up and I just pulled a dress on and it was this classic 80s flowered dress with a big bow in the back. The back was a V-neck and it was just this cotton, I probably have it in the attic somewhere, quite honestly, it was hilarious looking. 
and I was at the park and I was doing my morning prayers. And so when you're not drinking or when I'm not drinking, I would think anyone, you wake up in the morning very clear headed. Even after a lousy night's sleep, you don't have that alcohol haze or that drug addicted haze when you wake up and you're, you're like, ugh, and you can't function. I needed coffee, don't get me wrong, but I didn't have that horrible feeling. And so I would always quickly do a prayer before I get out of bed. And then I would utilize some part of my morning. And this was a summertime memory. So it was likely the summer of 91. It would have been later in the summer. And I just remember feeling so happy. Now, another big memory here is Chaz and I at this time had stopped dating and I had not yet started dating Graham. So I was like in between relationships. It was sort of, I didn't have a relationship. I didn't have a lot of money. I owed a lot of people money. You know, I, even though I had gotten rid of a lot of debt, I overextended myself. I have a, another long history for me is money. I'll have to do a podcast episode on that someday. My memory is of me standing by the bridge near the pond at White's Park. And it's a beautiful sunny day. And I have this stupid dress on and flip flops. And Puppy Tug is running around and I'm sipping my coffee. And I just was happy. And then my running was going real well. Everything was just sort of clicked into place. And it was the summer of 1991. I had done two years now at Princeton camp. And so that was something that I loved and was like building to my repertoire as a successful person. And I was just happy. And I felt like, okay, I've done this. I've done this thing. And I really have to say, even with, you know, you know, everything else going on in my life, I maintained that sort of solid, sober, healthy status for a long time. For all of 1991 and 1992, and then 1992 into 1993. So this was when I was 27, 28, 29. I turned 30 in 1993. I'm not quite there yet. So in the process of really jumping into sobriety, I had to look at, with AA, you know, you can't do anything. There's no such thing as the marijuana maintenance method. If you're smoking pot and you're not sober, AA is very, very specific that other than maybe perhaps medication that's prescribed by a doctor because you have a mental illness that you're coping with, really, you have to be chemical free in AA. It might say alcoholics, but addiction is addiction. I already had a lot going for me in AA because I, I didn't smoke pot. Like everyone in the 80s, you know, cocaine was huge in the 80s. And I, you know, I almost shudder to say that now because we live in such a different time frame around drugs, at least, at least in my circles, that's how I see it. And you think of cocaine, you immediately think of, you know, some heavy duty crack addict or, you know, a big movie star. I don't know. You think of people that you can't relate to at all. But in the 80s, this was, you know, early 80s was prior to AIDS. So as long as you were on the pill, you know, STDs were probably rampant, but it was just a different time. So, you know, getting high and, you know, going out, partying, it was just common. A lot of people did it. I hung out primarily with athletes. So I would have to say in my athletic social group, I probably was one of the only ones just because, you know, we were all sponsored by a shoe company or running on a scholarship. So you had to be careful around that. It moderated your behavior. When I moved home, my last weekend before I came home was, you know, a wedding and all the parties and things that go along with it. And there were lots and lots and lots of things I put into my body that weekend, along with alcohol. And so it wasn't difficult to come home and want to clean up and want to change that behavior. For all of that school year that I taught at Second Start and for my first year teaching in Concord, I busied myself with the tasks at hand, which was being a good special ed teacher, doing plays and volunteering at the Kimball Jenkins Estate, the Victorian Society of New Hampshire, running, running road races, coaching, and doing all the social things that go along with coaching a team. I had so much going on and so many things that kept me busy and healthy that sobriety was not a challenge for me. And I think sometimes it's easy for addicts to get complacent. Oh, that was no big deal. And I do know years and years later when I picked up alcohol again, I was okay for a bit, but once I was with daily drinkers, you know, I fell right into that habit. That can be dangerous. So AA is, you know, there's 12 steps. It's a 12 step program. And the 12 step philosophy is used by a lot of other things. Overeaters Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Gambling Anonymous. Anything that's an addiction can benefit from the 12 steps. Uh, look at, given to me by Jim Al at my first AA meeting, 9-23-89. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, Jim L, shout out to you. It's a 12-step program. And so this book is a whole history of how AA started and what went into it and how the founders, Bill and Bob, came up with all of their ideas. So step one is we admit we're powerless over alcohol and our lives become unmanageable. This is a hangout for a lot of people. There are people that don't want to admit they're powerless over anything. I'm in charge. You know, it's not my fault. It's the alcohol's fault. Or the reason I drink is because she's a jerk. You know, people come up with excuses for their behavior. This is a hard one. Typically, somebody comes to this realization when their life is so utterly bad that they can't function. 
So for me, my life wasn't utterly bad. I was living with my parents who loved me. I had food on the plate. I had a roof over my head, but I had injured myself. I had been removed from my running team. I felt my life was unmanageable and that I couldn't keep living the way I was living. Nothing was going to change. I wonder if I like that right now. Huh. That's step one. Step two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. This one can be a hang up for atheists or people who don't believe in God or don't believe in religion because you know, AA was founded by two men who are Christians. You know, the Lord's Prayer is recited at the end of every meeting and the Serenity Prayer, and these are very Christian-based. I would have to say that there's no requirement to believe in anything, but all of us believe in something greater than ourselves, whether it's a scientist or a physicist, whether it's the power of the wind, whether it's, who knows, it doesn't have to be God. This can be a hangout for people and, and, you know, rightfully so. Number three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him, and that's italicized, again, it does not have to be God. But when, when you can't control a behavior, you have to call on something greater than you to control it. So maybe maybe AA as a group is your God. Maybe that's the power greater than yourself, the AA meetings and coming to the meetings. Number four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. So this is another area that can be difficult, especially if somebody is a, has a narcissistic personality you know, tendency because people like that don't ever look at themselves as the reason that anything has gone wrong. And because that can be a, a, a hard way to live, you know, oh, everyone I've dated is a psychopath. You know, I had a, someone in my life that said that. Well, okay, except you're the only common denominator. So, you know, where's that? So this was another piece that was hard for people. As I said before, I wasn't in such a bad place that I, I, I looked at all of these. I had no trouble making a list. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So I didn't sit down and make a list of everyone I'd hurt and share it with somebody. I made the list of everyone I had hurt. I made a list of things that I felt I had done wrong. I firmly believe that just by creating the list, God already knows the list because as a he, she, it knows everything. I think in my sharing and my storytelling in meetings, I was able to share the nature of my wrongdoings that I had, you know, shown up at track meets, hungover and you know, showed up at workouts, still drunk, that I had hurt my boyfriend and, you know, all those kinds of things. Not respected my college scholarship, those kinds of things. Number six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Again, when I read this and I try to step into the lens of someone that doesn't believe in God, there's a lot of God here, but I would rewrite these for somebody that needed to hear it a different way. So when you have God remove someone, that, so that's the power of prayer. It's like, you have to give it up. You have to let it go. And that's sort of what forgiveness is. Forgiveness isn't like saying, it's okay that you hurt me. Forgiveness is saying, I'm going to drop the hot coal of hatred I have for you and forgive you so that my hand isn't burning anymore. We have this idea that by accepting weakness or by giving something over that we're not being strong. And really all we're doing is stopping hurting ourselves. So by giving it over to God, we're saying a prayer, we're having a meditation or a thought and we're saying, okay, I'm going to give this shortcoming I gossip too much. Okay, I'm going to give that over to God or I'm going to give that over to the frog that's chirping outside my window. I'm going to give that over to the wind that's blowing the leaves in the trees right now. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to just let it go. Number seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. We want to be ready for God to remove them and then we ask him to remove them or we want to be ready for the universe to remove them and then we ask the universe to remove them. So there's a little bit more intention here because by asking someone that you may or may not know if they exist or not, or an entity, or the wind, or a blade of grass, you don't get an immediate response that they're going to do these things for you. So really, the intention here is, this to me is the step where you decide, I'm going to fix this. Number eight, made a list of all people we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. So the word here is willing. You have to be willing to say, you know what, I'm really sorry I did that, making an amend. And with an amend, there's no, if they say, screw you, and I want to see you again, that's all right. You've made your amend. You've done the best you can. The first step is being willing to do it. Not only to say, yeah, I really screwed her over, but I'm actually really willing, willing to tell her I screwed her over and that I feel badly about it. Number nine is made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. By looking for an apology or making an amend, if doing so would cause further hurt to the person that you hurt, then you don't do it. You make the amend to like your sponsor, or you make the amends to what you believe God to be. You make your amend. Sometimes you make your amend by never doing that to anyone else. 
if your injurious behavior you did to somebody and then you find out they've passed away, you can make your amends to their soul, but you can also honor the amend by never doing that again. Number 10, continue to take a personal inventory when we were wrong and promptly admitted it. So now you're setting up a new lifestyle for yourself where, all right, it's not just about not drinking. It's also about consciously on a daily level, taking a personal inventory. What did I do good today? What could I work on today? Where did I fail today? How can I be a better person? Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So again, in, in this book, it's God and the word is God. But as we understand him, the one thing I don't like about the English language is there's no neutral. There's him and her. Actually, neutral could be they or them. And I think I need to increase my ability to use it that way. I, should, I think I'll refer to God that way from now on as we understood them. Because how we understand God is different from person to person. You can sit in a church full of people and each of them understands God differently. How we understand God is our relationship to them not what we read, what they were like in a book. And then number 12, having had a spiritual awakening or an aha moment, as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Number 12 leads me into one of the biggest criticisms of AA, and this comes from people that aren't alcoholics or don't go to AA, and that is that the only way you stay sober is by going to meetings. Now you're just addicted to the meetings. Well, I would say, no, no, that's not it at all. The service component of Alcoholics Anonymous is huge. And the way that you serve others is to be there when the new people come, because people, new people come to AA all the time. And I know for me, the people I mentioned that I saw in my first few meetings and that were so happy to see me and so supportive were all seasoned alcoholics. Harriet had been going to AA for like 25, 30 years, like a long time. So if it was only the new alcoholics that were there, it wouldn't take long before AA was just a bonfire in the woods with a keg of beer. So AA is very much about abstinence. You pick a date and you have a sobriety date. You get little chips every month and then a year and then you have medallions and, and then if you falter, you have to start over. It's very, very black and white that way. And there are definitely alcoholics that need it to be that way. These are often people that have violence or trauma around their alcohol use. These are often people that also did other drugs and alcohol is a gateway to getting back into shooting heroin. Very, very, very different. In the years to follow and in my sobriety journey, I've come across a couple of other ones. And while I had a very easy time dealing with sobriety in those early years at home, my first couple, well, you know, my first five or six years at home, really, it hasn't always been that way. One of the other things that really got me connected to other sober people is I became very, very involved in the Baha'i faith again. That's my religion. Well, my religion growing up was Episcopalian. And then my parents divorced and remarried. During that time, they found the Baha'i faith. And then my brother Rick became a Baha'i. And so then I became a Baha'i. So a lot of my high school and college memories are around people that belong to the Baha'i faith. In the Baha'i faith, one of the sort of social constructs of the faith is that you don't drink. Now, there's a book of laws, like it's not the Bible, but it's like a book of laws in the faith, guidelines to live by. And there are like six references to alcohol in there. And there are like 230 references to gossip and backbiting. Your tongue is your worst, your worst weapon and be kind with what you say. And so I used to feel incredibly you know, proud of myself that I didn't drink anymore and incredibly guilty as a Baha'i that I did, until I read that book and realized the number of people I knew that gossiped Baha'i and otherwise, far away the number of people that drank. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, I think sometimes we pick and choose the laws to focus on and to hold others accountable to. For me, alcohol was one of them, but so much of my social life at that time was around alcohol. It was at this time, my first two years or so back into Concord, that I met, but re-met my good friend, Polly. I have such a strong memory. I was coaching track and Polly was at a softball game. We're at Memorial Field. And she was like, Barb! And we had run into each other at an AA meeting. So she was so excited to see me at the field and so excited that I was back. Actually, maybe she had heard I had been one and we hadn't seen each other. We were both in active recovery at that time. I will leave all other details out. We started hanging out all the time and just spent so much time together. We used to go out for breakfast all the time. <laughs> we would talk about wanting to lose weight. We just connected and became good friends immediately. And... Although there's like five years apart, you know, age difference with us, we we're both in our 20s at the time, and it's very hard to find people in that age group that don't drink. And so this was an issue for us, trying to, you know, just really trying to find a sober group of friends to hang out with. So I had this new life now. In my old life, it had been David and his family and Nike and all the running and all of that. In my new life, it was Polly, it was Chaz, it was my school teacher friends. I had an actual real job that I was 
showing up to on time and I wasn't missing because I was hungover. And I was coaching something that I'm very naturally gifted at and truly I'm still hurt and angry that I'm not doing right now. This is a current 2022 piece of growth for Barb to try to manifest better feelings around that. At any rate, this was my life. When I look back on it, the sun is always shining. I'm looking at all those really old Concord Highway track uniforms. <laughs> and I'm thinking back to people that jump out at me. My good friend, Chris Wentworth. Hi, Chris. We met then. She was one of my first, one of my very first runners. Chris Basha, another Chris. This is a guy who lives across the street from me now. His sister rents Coach's house for me. He had run with my sister, Johanna, all of that. So he comes up for me. Uh, Shady Jendrick and Chad Peterson, they ran one season of track for me and then off they went to college and they live in the Midwest and the far West and they come up for me. You know, I just see, I see faces that come up into my memory. Lisa Couture, her son's working at my track camp next week. So she comes up for me. So my life was just full of people that didn't exist in my prior life. They were just brand new people that didn't exist. While this might seem healthy, there's a thing in AA called a geographical cure. And it's when you use geography to fix your problem. You you move someplace new and you create a whole new group of people. And then the old people that were your problem don't exist anymore. And you just live in this new world. And this actually evokes a very strong Roy memory for me right now, because this is something that he does. He, you know, gets rid of the people that he doesn't like, and they don't exist anymore. He creates a whole new group and now has this new life and the old people are invisible. I'm not criticizing because it's something that I've done myself. I would call it putting it all in a box, but you, but what happens is you carry the box with you. The box is always there. It's like an album full of pictures of this person that you, that you keep. So you can always take the chance of opening up the album and oh, who's this person? Well, that person has a name and, and that person is still in your life. It's no different with the things that, that lead into addiction in the first place. So even though I was back here, when I say back here, and now I'm back in Concord, which is the place that I grew up in as a child. It's where my child abuse occurred. It's where some pretty intense things during my high school years occurred. Now it's also where I broke five minutes in the mile. And, you know, I had wonderful things happen to me as well. But you can never go home again, or can you, is sometimes a very, very true statement. And now I was in a place that had a lot of new things that didn't exist in Boston and had a lot of recurring things that existed before Boston. And then had all my connections to Boston. I still maintained friendships. I ran for Nike. It was a time of balance. The faith and putting that into my life in an active way is something else that really kept me sober in those days. I was never a pot smoker. My addiction to Coke, I was never addict addicted to cocaine. It was something that if it was around and people were partying, I was right there with everyone else to do it. But it was never around and I never bought it. So, you know, it wasn't something that I had to actively give up. Part of me doesn't even remember doing it back then. You know, all of those things worked together to create pretty easy sobriety for me. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit right now because I really want to talk about addiction. This will set up the episodes I do months from now around my horrible addiction after Molly's death, all the things that went into that. In my post-AA life, I, I had seven years at that time, right around seven years of sobriety in my late 20s and early 30s. I started drinking again. It was mostly social in the beginning. When Kenny and I got together, it really became daily. Kenny was a daily drinker and we drank a lot in the beginning. Actually, so much of our marriage, so much of what we've argued about and fought about, what we struggle with to this day is alcohol use. And there are just different, different ideas around it. I'm the first one to say I have trouble with alcohol. I call myself a cocktail hour alcoholic sometime. When I look at my biology, my dad was a cocktail hour alcoholic. Tom never let a day go by that he did not have two Happy Valley stingers. That's what we call them or beer, or wine, or whatever it was. Was he drunk all the time? Absolutely not. He was a practicing physician and a medical hypnoanalyst. He raised children. He hiked mountains and skied. He was a picture of health. He lived in 98 years. But I can remember coming down mountains, hiking when I would hike with he and my mom growing up, sprinting down a mountain if the liquor store was going to close before we, before we could get to it because he had forgotten to buy vermouth or he'd forgotten to buy white creme de menthe or whatever he needed for his drinks. When I look at my family members on my bio side, mom and dad both, and Mr. Higgins, you know, my Mr. Higgins' dad was a bad alcoholic, a, a ragingly mean drunk, did bad things to everybody when he was drunk. And so when he sobered up, that was all at once. Now, he never went to AA and call that a dry drunk. Not only do I have a lot of addicts and alcoholics in my life, biologically speaking, nature versus nurture both, but I have a lot of them who deny that they have a problem. And Kenny would be one of those people. He'll, you know, well, yeah, I guess I do. But, you know, well, let's go to AA meetings. Oh, man, I, don't, I don't need that. Okay, but drink all the time, so maybe you do. These are things that come up and I have to 
you know, bite my tongue and be judgmental. Sitting here today in 2022, I don't know that I want to abstain from alcohol 100%. I really enjoy a cocktail when I'm out. I really enjoy a cocktail when I come home after a long day. I would like to not do that every day. I would like to go weeks and weeks and weeks without even thinking about it. I'm in that conundrum right now. In my life, and really primarily my current life, since Molly's death, since I finally realized she's never coming back, which for me would be 2018. I know she'd been gone two years, but that's how it is. I can remember at that time was when I first started working with KK and doing spiritual mentoring. And it was at that time when I was trying to have Jack, I had to stop taking everything. It was a no-brainer to not use cocaine or any of those kinds of drugs in getting ready to have Jack because those are bad drugs. It took me so long to get off all of the medicines I was on, all the medication I couldn't take. And I remember at that time, KK saying, well, you need to stop drinking. And I'm like, screw that. I'm going off 9 million other things. I'm keeping the alcohol. And I needed it. I admit. I needed it. And there could be people that say, well, you only need it because you say you needed it. Okay, well, you have a dead kid and lose Roy and lose the entire life you thought you were going to have and lose the daughter that you knew because the one that exists now is distraught and nothing is the same. I am very sensitive to that. We all do it differently. For my grief journey, alcohol was a saving vice when I had to go off all the other medications. No more Xanax, no more sleeping pills, no more wake-up pills, no more no panic pills no more pain pills, all the things I had to stop. I didn't give up drinking. And in some ways, I think my drinking might've even accelerated that because because I would get to the end of the day much more, you know, keenly aware of how sad I still was or stressed out I was. And so in the fall of 2019, so now it had been a year, I'd had the brain tumors found and taken out. Kenny had gotten the kidney. And this was another whole sort of like, oh my gosh. And I was still really actively trying to have a baby. We actually did an IVF transfer that summer 2019. And so for the two and a half, three weeks, I thought I was pregnant. I didn't drink. Let me also be clear about this. Even though I was an absolute daily drinker, the moment I had an IVF transfer, before I even knew if I was pregnant or not, I had no trouble not drinking. Absolutely no trouble. Zero. Didn't miss it at all. It's just a click. The whole time I was pregnant with Jack, not once did I desire alcohol. I drank some white wine a couple of times, like a white wine spritzer, but I never was like, oh, I want vodka ever. I just didn't think about it. In the fall of 2019, once the IVF didn't work, I knew that I would have to try again. And we began that process and then I would be able to try again. I remember getting the phone call. I was in the pool and getting the phone call from the nurse. Nope, it didn't work. You're not pregnant. And hanging up the phone and looking over at Kenny and saying, okay, I guess we can have drinks tonight. And I started drinking like I had never stopped. It's amazing that toggle switch in my head. It's just like, click, it's on, click, it's off. It's not a dimmer. It's on or off for me. That's probably a sign of some type of addictive issue around alcohol. So I started this thing. I did this thing. It's called This Naked Mind. And I'm pulling up a book. It's written by a woman named Annie Grace. There's another one called The Alcohol Experiment. These books are awesome. And if you're somebody that that struggles at all with alcohol, it's a non-AA way to look at it. And there's active online groups on Facebook and online, Zoom calls and meetings, workbooks, questions to answer, reframing language. It really takes a more neuro psychological approach to not drinking. And you do these experiments, you just try to, you know, November, you try to go the month of November without drinking. So in my 12 or so months of really, really, really doing a lot of these exercises every day, I never went 30 days without drinking. I just didn't, you know, there was no baby in me. COVID came in the spring of 2020. Everybody was stuck home and it became very easy to drink and very hard not to. And then COVID put a halt on all the IVF stuff. There wasn't some giant thing I needed to be healthy. I do remember talking to my doctor at the time in the spring of 2020 and going on a pill, taking a pill every day that would make me not crave alcohol. I had minimal results from that. There were two different pills you could take and one sort of made me not feel the alcohol, but it didn't satiate my desire for it. So I was like chasing the buzz. So I didn't like that. And then the other one just didn't make a change. So I stopped taking them right away. But then summer of 2020, I got pregnant. And so there you go. I just, all right, there goes that. But what I liked about the alcohol experiment is if you, if you were doing the 30 day thing and you did five alcohol free days and then you drank, it wasn't like, oh no, I have to start over. No, you just had a day that you drank and you pick up where you left off. So I will say at the end of that November, now keep in mind, Mr. Looney died right at the end of that November. And that was terrible. (laughs) I think I had like 20 alcohol free days in that 30 day month. That's amazing. To me, that is amazing because I was able to have more than half of the days that I didn't drink. If I had to say a a goal behavior I have now around alcohol, it would be that I could not drink more than I drink. Having said that, the other piece for me 
as an alcohol consumer, and this is true from my first beer with Anna Fine in my attic on Essex Street in 1975 or 76, is that once I have one, I want another and I want another and I want another. So I easily, easily binge drink. Kenny's the same way. So if we have alcohol in our house, we never buy you know, a fifth of vodka because we would drink the fifth of vodka because there's more there. It would always be very difficult for us. We would both make drinks and then pass out, wake up in the morning, this full you know, drink of vodka that we never drank because in our intoxicated mind, we wanted more. That's something that I'm very, very keen to. And if I, and if I had to give myself a compliment on managing alcohol consumption is that we buy little shooters and, and that's all we get. You know, we use one and a half shooters per drink and a full can of seltzer. So we're getting a lot of regular liquid. Two, maybe two and a half of those a day is all is the match that we do. So for a non-drinker, two and a half drinks a day, that's a lot of a lot of drinks. But for us who could put a handle of, you know, McNaughton whiskey away in two days, we look at ourselves like, all right, we're doing great. But this is where I'm at. I'm still in this battle around it. So I've tried a couple of other things as well. So I've done it's called A Return to Love. And this is a book by Marianne Williamson. And it's her reflections on A Course in Miracles. So this is like how to love myself and connect with God. And maybe if I do these things, I won't want to drink so much. Okay, well, I have a hard time following through. So I haven't followed through on this. And then here is my Course in Miracles book. I want you to notice that the seat is still in it. I haven't even picked it up. One of the reasons I struggled with that, and this is a reason people struggle with AA, is I didn't like the wording in, in the first two or three lessons. It talked about looking at things and taking away all their meaning, they mean nothing. And when I started this, I was still very attached and I'm still very attached to a lot of things that belonged to Molly. I remember right after her death, when, when Roy was, and I were deciding what to do now, because I wasn't going to kick Kenny out because that's Gracie's dad. And, and you know, what do I do? What do I do? And he very much wanted to come up and I know, I feel that he wanted to do it out of a good place, but you know, he wanted to clean out my house and start over. And all I could think of was that he would be making Molly invisible. Things to somebody in grief can become very, very, very important. And as an addict and addictive personality, anything that helped me maintain control was incredibly important. This sort of path, alcohol path, didn't work for me. And I'm, I'm still in, in this process with spiritual mentoring and this power play circle I'm in with Lisa Somerville. I'm still, still all the time processing self-love and hatred and all the things that we say. I'm going to hold this book up again, The Body Keeps the Score, because this is the first book that instead of looking at my behaviors, looked at my traumas and what my behaviors indicate around how I was coping with the traumas. And all the judgment flew away from me. And actually, it's probably one of the first times I've been able to really look in the mirror and not say, I hate you. I hate myself. This was a big change for me in my spiritual mentoring with KK to stop saying, I hate myself. I hate myself. I probably said that a thousand times a day. There are times that I still say it, but I immediately go, no, 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 Barbara Jean Higgins, you do not hate yourself. <laughs> you hate this and you hate that, or you're feeling hatred, but I take it away from hating myself. So now what I'm doing, it's online and it's an app and it's called Reframe. And every day you have tasks. So you start with setting an alcohol consumption goal. So I put six drinks a week and I would call a drink one and a half shooters. So that would be nine shooters a week. You go through every day and you, you do all these things each day. So the first thing you do when you wake up is you read like a piece of information. And this is an unbelievable brain talking about the neurological issues and the physical issues around alcohol and what it does to your body, which then what it does to your behavior. So you're not being told, oh, you're weak, you're an addict, give it up, be strong. None of that. It's really, really learning about how alcohol works on a physical level and why it makes you feel the way you feel. So much of our chemical makeup is hormonal in nature, which is all drugs imitate hormones, serotonin, dopamine, any drug that makes you feel high and happy is imitating both of those things. So today's little reading task was changing our brains through neuroplasticity. So this talks about how our brains pick up habits because of something that's happening to them and how we can change them by doing the same thing. This one talked about, you know, cravings. If you have a craving, a typical craving lasts about 20 minutes. So for the 20 minutes, you're really craving a drink. Take yourself away from where you normally have the drink. They included all these video games on here. One is Tetris, which takes me back to, you know, where those shapes come down, you have to fill it all in. I got really frustrated, so I stopped playing it. But the whole point here is even if after 20 minutes or a half an hour, an hour, you'd have a drink, what you have done is you've begun the process of changing the neuroplasticity in your brain. You've changed 
the immediate, oh, I want a drink, and then having a drink. You're changing that message. It's always the message. When I tell Barb I want a drink, she makes a drink. So the brain continues to tell you that because it's five o'clock and this is usually when I want a drink. So the other things on here, then after you've done that, you read the daily motivation. And today's was failure is instructive. The person who really thinks learns quite as much from his failures as from his successes, John Dewey. So yesterday they had a Glennon Doyle quote. They have, they're all over the place. Versus you can do hard things. So you have a motivation. Then you have to log your mood. When I wake up in the morning, I'm always just like looking at the 9,000 things I have to do. And so I'm always like stressed, overwhelmed, anxious. And then practicing affirmations. So today's practicing affirmations was write down one I statement that's positive. So I wrote, I am strong. That was my affirmation. Every day you have to do a little affirmation that creates a positive self outlook. And then you log your drinks. So yesterday I logged three drinks. So yesterday was Thursday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I've had three drinks a day, all four of those days. So that's 12 drinks and my weekly goal is six. <laughs> so I've already doubled my, you know, so at any rate, this is what you do each day. I have not cut down on my drinking at all yet. I just know that if that's the first thing I focus on, I won't cut down on it. If anything, it will make me want to drink more. There's this saying in AA, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. So am I trying just one more way to stop drinking? Yes, I am. But I'm not trying the same way. I'm not rereading the book. I'm not trying to do something again. Oh, I failed last time. I'll try it again. Maybe it'll work this time. I have looked for something that is a bit more simple and a bit more easily manageable. And so that would be the reframe. All of these things take into account other things that I tend not to do. Common behavior with addicts is to be so busy that you can't think because if you stop to think, then you're going to want to think about what you're addicted to. A common situation with abuse victims is to be so busy you can't think because if you stop and have time to think, you think about your trauma or the bad things that have happened. This has been an incredibly difficult piece of my behavior that I need to change to sit still. And so maybe that's something I need to do every day for five minutes is just sit still. I struggle greatly with it because I don't like to sit still. I drive to Amesbury two, three, sometimes four times a week. So I have time in the car. So I am better now at, well, I listen to a podcast or I listen to my own podcast to make sure it sounds okay. Listening to podcasts has also been incredibly helpful because through experiencing things, so I can share our experience, strength, and hope with others. So by sharing what we've gone through and how we've come out okay on the other side, it gives others hope. That's a huge piece of AA, and it's one of the main reasons of this podcast. Why am I spending time talking about how I quit drinking in 1990 or 1989? Well, because it's still a major piece of my life. 33 years later, alcohol remains an issue for me. It's, it remains something I carry along. I did best at not drinking when I didn't drink at all. I will say in my life, in my marriage to Eric life, we both belong to the pie faith, and so neither of us drank. And then in my marriage to Kenny life, alcohol has been a, an issue a lot. A long lot. I stayed away in Exeter a year ago, right now, May and June. I spent a lot of time in Exeter trying to navigate Jack's nursing. And of course, when you're nursing, you're trying to nurse all the time. You can't drink. When I'm not in this house, I have a much easier time not drinking. So here we go with a geographical cure. But it's logical to me. I look at it as a trigger, you know, coming home to this house in the evening, what I've always done since we bought this house in 2000, so 22 years ago is have drinks in the evening. More nights than not, that's been my reality, except pregnant and nursing. So, you know, how do we, how do we navigate this and how do I navigate this? I don't really know that I have like a, oh, yay for me ending to this podcast episode. I do very much feel that addiction and addictive behaviors are far more common and prevalent than anyone is willing to admit. And when you look at certain things through the lens of addiction, you get a certain view on and a certain take on them. What I liked about The Body Keeps the Score is addiction was one of the ways that people respond to and cope with trauma. They take alcohol or drugs to blur out the pain or numb the pain. And so sometimes addicts become clean because they have to go to rehab and they're, they're deprived from it long enough to give their bodies a chance to you know not need it anymore. Oftentimes, however, once these people are out of their confined places, their sober houses, et cetera, that doesn't take long before they're right back at it again. I don't have that kind of fear and alarm over being a not falling down drunk alcoholic, but I do know that a lot of my relationship with Kenny centers around managing alcohol. And that isn't a healthy 
a healthy place for me to be. I don't quite know what to do sometimes around my life and the day-to-day realities of it. And I think that sometimes when I finish my day and I come home, you know, a couple of drinks makes me feel a lot better. I do like the fact that I don't, you know, if I drink a lot, I lose memory, which I think a lot of people do. And that's not something that is ever okay with a baby. So (laughs) Jack is this nice sort of guide for me. He keeps me sober because he's a little baby and he's adorable and yummy. And he needs me and he didn't ask to come here. So, you know, in getting ready to talk about this episode, what I do remember about that time, about my early years of sobriety. So the year I moved back, I was 26. I turned 27. So then I was 27 and then 28 and then 29. So I had three years of sobriety from 1989, actually up to the fall of 93. So my first four years here, I take that back. 26, 27, 28, 29. Those first four years here, a year and a half living with my parents, then a year and a half living with Cheryl, and then another year living on my own in an apartment, a couple of different apartments by myself. I was in so many ways, just very, very happy. I had healthy relationships at the time. My relationship, as I moved out of living with Cheryl, I lived with Cheryl and I got a puppy dog in the fall of 91 and I'm allergic to dogs and she had a dog. So we would keep the dogs out of my room, except that I got a dog. And so I had to sleep with the dog and, and I was running really well in the fall of 91. I would get up two days a week and drive to Harvard University to their indoor track. Tuesday and Thursday mornings, I'd get up at like 4.30 and I would meet my coach there and I'd do a track workout. In those two days, I came to school at Walker a little bit late. I went to Boston and I'd show up at, you know, nine o'clock. Yeah, I drove to Boston, did a track workout, came home. And I started getting slower and slower and slower, just unbelievably slow, just really slow. At that time, I had also broken up with Chaz and I was really good friends with this guy, Graham. I just started getting sicker and sicker and I couldn't understand it. I didn't know why, I didn't know why. And suddenly I ended up in the hospital. I got really, really sick and my doctor hospitalized me and I had RSV, which is a lung virus. 11 days in the hospital, I could not breathe. It took me, it took me so many days in that hospital to just be able to breathe again, even though I was getting IV meds and on oxygen and everything else. And I had to give the dog away at that time, Samantha, Samar the Bammer. And I gave her away. I gave her to a family in East Concord. And I remember she died a few years after that from snout cancer. And oh, I cried and cried. Having that dog taught me what it's like to love a pet because I'd never had them. I'm allergic to everything. And like when little puppy tug first, you know, peed outside or I couldn't find her and she was sitting by the door waiting for me to take her out to pee. And it was sweet. And I'd come home and she'd do a 360 in the air because she was so happy to see me. I really got it. I understood puppy love. It made me so sick that it decimated my chances. I wanted to run in the Olympic trials in 1992. And and I was so sick that I basically had to stop running. I had to wear a mask. I had to wear a mask running for like six months because the air had to be warm underneath my face. And it wasn't until it was like a 90 degree humid day that I felt I could run without a mask. I did all my training wearing a mask for a long time. And I still wear them to run and run forever. But in the winter, when I'm outside, I'll put a mask on so that the cold air doesn't make me wheeze. When I got really sick, that Jim and I really started dating. And so that was all of 92 and into 93. And so during those years, I was sober. I didn't drink at all. And I actually can remember when I was dating Graham that, you know, he would worry. I never minded if he had a beer woman out. It didn't, it didn't phase me. But I remember, you know, when we talked about if we ever got married or if we lived together, you know, could he have alcohol in the house? And of course I didn't want alcohol in the house. I didn't, I wanted to have an alcohol free house, but as someone that's a healthy drinker, that loves to have a beer now and then to not have to always go out and buy it when you want it. This was a conversation. It was a big conversation. You know, it just comes back to me now because I'm talking about how alcohol use and alcoholism was for me at that time. It was easiest for me to to align myself with people that really, really shouldn't be around alcohol because they would do decimatingly crazy things under, under its influence. As much as I drank in my years, all my years with Kenny, any really crazy drunk nights, I was away from kids. There was always a measure of control because there had to be. I have to tell stories about my job loss and being so drunk and throwing up at cheers. I had my little moments here and there, but in general, I would have to say, if I had to describe myself, I would say I'm like a functional alcoholic, like somebody that, like I'm a gray area drinker where I'm not like a hardcore alcoholic and I'm not sober. I'm somewhere in the middle where there are times I manage it well and times that I don't. My inability or my unwillingness to just cut it out completely is probably more telling than anything I can say to say I'm not, I don't have an issue. I just think that the more that we can be honest with ourselves and one another around addiction, the better off we all are. I had a group of kids that would sit in my office at school when I taught at Concord High. And I remember I had a group of them in there and one girl was a hardcore cutter. Oh, the damage she did to her body at the hands of a razor blade because the pain just eased it for her. 
And while I never got to know her well enough to know what happened to her in her life to make her do this, it wasn't pretty. Cutting is a really, really self-injurious pain equals I'm okay. Pain equals pleasure. Pain equals my head doesn't hurt now, just my leg where I cut it. And then I had a girl that pulled her hair out. She just half bald because she could not pull her hair out under stress. And then I had a girl that threw up her food and we're all talking and I'm like, you all have the same problem. None of you are different. You all have a stress, a way of dealing with stress. You puke your food, you pull your hair out and you cut yourself. It's the same thing. And so once we could see the commonality, these girls it was such a wonderful eye-opening conversation for them. I'll never forget it because addiction is addiction and the rush, and they all talk about the rush they got when they did it and the regret they had after. So, you know, you take that first hit a pot, or your first snort of cocaine, or your first sip of alcohol, and you're like, oh. And then after you, you know, six beers later, or, you know, five joints later, or two grams later, you're like, what have I done? You know, that horrible regret. I'll never do it again until the next time you do it again. And I know that the girl that was an active bulimic said that the rush of throwing up, she felt so good after. And then it would slowly creep in how bad she felt. And sometimes that would just make her want to do it again. And to me, that's most relatable to how Coke used to feel for me you know, in the eighties, when you do a, you do a line, you have this rush, but it's a very quick drug. It's gone in moments. And then all you want to do is another line. And of course you get to the point where none of them make you feel good. All of this is the same thing. And so if you're listening to me and you've never had an issue with alcohol, maybe you've never had an issue with anything, but all of us have some sort of habit that we'd like to break that we can't, or we don't. And sometimes the habits are helpful. I'm definitely a workout addict and I've often worked out injured because to not work out is worse. So that might be a negative side of it, but we all have things. If you take a big breath and really look inward, as the big book says to do, a self-inventory, all of us can find things, habits, things that we do that we wish we didn't and would like to stop doing and don't. So I'm going to end it here. I've been teaching now in the district for years. I feel very, very solid there. I'm coaching cross-country and indoor track. Outdoor track, I didn't come back to until a bit later, but I was a two or three season coach for a long time. I have... Dated Chaz and then broke up with Chaz. And then I reconnected with another Boston boyfriend named Mark and then broke up with him. And then I was dating Jim. And so I end there. I end sort of there. My next episode, will talk a little bit into my first marriage and the things I gleaned from that. But all of this, because I was going to move home for one year and then I didn't. And in looking at how I tried to rebuild my life, you know, when I left Concord to go to BU, it was like, yes, I'm leaving this all behind. I'm never coming back. And then I did come back and saw, yes, I'm leaving all that behind so I can rebuild my life. And now I haven't left here. It's been 33 years, but I do already in the telling of this podcast, see patterns that I repeat where things blow up and I have to do something different. And I am brought back to that day on my back porch, two weeks before Molly died, when I just said, oh, Barbara, something's going to blow up. You got to do something. Not knowing that the thing that would blow up had everything and nothing to do with me and my issues. So anyway. That's that. Do yourself a favor. The good thing you can do for yourself is to sit down and take a look at things that you do. This book I'm reading called Atomic Habits is also really good. I'm reading this for my power, power circle group, but my friend KK, who's spiritual mentoring nest group called The Nest I'm in, also brought this up. And one of the activities is to just make a list of everything you do all day long. List everything you do in a given day. Just as you do it, write it down, brush my teeth, go to the bathroom, eat breakfast, drink coffee, everything you do. And at the end of the day, You look back on it and you put a plus, a minus, or an equals next to it, positive, negative, neutral. And then you look at what am I doing that's helping me in my long-term goals and what am I doing that's not helping me? So do that. Make a list of everything you do in a given day. Put a positive and a negative next to every single thing. And if it's neutral, then an equal sign or an N or whatever. And see if your daily life is really helping you be what you want to be. I know that for the most part, mine is, but there are significant pieces of it that are not. Thank you for listening to episode 43. Thank you for listening to my ramblings around my alcohol use and abuse and misuse. And as always, have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and for supporting A Thousand Tiny Steps. I hope you enjoyed the episode and will continue to listen. Feel free to leave a review and share my stories with your friends. Also, please reach out if you have stories to share. I love hearing from and connecting with my listeners. If you would like to know what I'll be talking about down the road, you can find me on Instagram at barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, www.1000tinysteps.com.